featured speakers today for Mercy Week, which is a week that we celebrate and we continue that building that awareness of our Mercy heritage in our community for the local area and then also our campus. So thank you again. Thank you for both coming here and let's begin. Good. Afternoon. I'm sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Okay, Jack can hear me. Um, I am Mrs. Roberts' oldest daughter. Uh, my mother wrote the book, it's called Earnest Life, with Janice Whelan of Adrian, Michigan. Janice lives two, two or three houses from my mother's apartment and happened to be my younger sister's best friend growing up. So she has known her since she was a very young woman, young girl, and now she's retired uh, from teaching English in, in, I believe, in high school. It was written by her and Janice together. Mother would tape. We gave her a tape recorder, and she started doing tapes. We tried this once many years ago, and it didn't work. She didn't have, connect with the woman that she was dealing with. So we, we wanted her to try again. So she tried. She was 97. She tried, and it worked. The two of them went through it. Mom would do the tapes, and Janice would do the writing. Uh, it took all winter plus part of the spring for us to put it together and then I had it published for the family and then Mrs. Whelan went to Amazon with it and now it's on Amazon and with Kindle so that's where you can find it. My mother was born in Tallinn, Estonia uh, of Latvian parents. My grandfather had gone to Tallinn, was the capital of Estonia, to work on, learn the trade of, of construction at that time and he was building the seawall which still exists and I've seen it. Uh, her father was working there until 1921. In 1921, they returned back to Latvia, so she was only, what, four years old. When they returned, my grandfather went into the construction world, and Latvia was booming at that time. The country was on the Baltic Sea, and the harbor, or the waters in the Baltic Sea bordering Latvia do not freeze. That is one of the reasons Germans dearly loved that piece of ground, because it was their only harbor that they had that wasn't frozen. Uh, after the war. A lot of nations have overrun Latvia over the, over the centuries. It's not, um, it hasn't been on its own all the time. It's on its own and somebody else takes it. It's on its own, somebody else takes it. Well, it's free again. They fought for their independence some years ago in the major, in the Latvian capital and it became a free country. The first woman who was president uh, happened to be taken to Canada as a child, and she went back to Latvia and became president. The current president is Latvian, and I'll tell you a cute story. My husband and I, and, and mother also, was with us. Um, her cousin said, do you want to see where the president uh, lives? No, our daughter was with us. We want to see where the president lives. So I said, sure, we, we'd like to see it. He's driving along this countryside road, and, and this looks very familiar. Well, it turns out that it was the same place my mother and my husband and I had been to a few years before that to meet this gentleman who was his friend. He now is the president of Latvia. We had no idea. I mean, he made me a cup of coffee in his, in his kitchen when I first met him. And when we came back home, I saw in the article, and I didn't realize it was the same man. He's a banker with the Swedish bank for many years and is currently the president of Latvia. We came, um, well, you have to remember about, we, we fled Latvia during the war, and Mother remembers in her book not only her youth and her marriage and all that, but what she had to do as a young wife and a mother so that her family could survive World War II and time afterwards. We came through Ellis Island, which my grandchildren find a hoot, they can't believe it. I had to get my documents out one time, my immigration papers, to show them that I actually did come through something and came on a boat. Uh, we came to the United States in November of 49, just before Thanksgiving, as a displaced family from a displaced persons camp in Germany. And we ended up in Michigan through the sponsorship of my father's uncle who found us through the Red Cross and sponsorship of the Quaker Church. So we had to live in a place for three months, work in that place for three months, and then after the three months you were allowed to go out into the community wherever you wanted to go uh, and end up with green cards. My mother at 98 now lives independently still in Michigan. She winters there and she summers here in Pennsylvania because she has family here and she loves the gardens. So she really comes to garden. Um, so we are happy to have her every summer. She's getting ready to, go, to leave um, on the 10th to go back home independently. 
um, and enjoy the winter. I have with us today mom's great granddaughter and my daughter in law, Diane McClanahan. So, Maddie and Diane. So, that's how I have. So, I'll let mom start talking about whatever she'd like. If, if there is a question and while she's speaking and there's something that you really'd like to know, just wave your hand and you know tell us what it is. She's more than happy to answer questions because it's hard to know what you are curious about. Obviously, one of the big topics in today's world is uh, are the refugees, are the immigrants, are the you know what what is going on and what happens to people that go through that kind of a life. I personally think what's happening now is different than World War II because we actually had camps where you could live and were set up and then processed through camps. A lot of people went to, to Australia, they went to Canada, they came to the United States, but you had to go through the whole process of the, in this country of the green cards. And to this day, some people still find it difficult to get a green card. So what happens to all this new system? I have no clue. So I'll let mom talk for a while and then you can ask. Go ahead, mom. Well, I don't know where to start. <laughs> This is a subject I don't like. For many years, I tried to forget. It is not something you know, but you want to remember. But when I street, my door demanded that I write something and tell what happened in the past. I finally, when they decided I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I started to get things together, get my memory going day and night, till I finally got things together. It is very, uh, very hard for you people to understand. Uh, can you imagine today you are at the home and uh, probably in the morning everything is all right and in the evening you are getting out and leaving and never return. Uh, it is very hard, that's what happened to me. Uh, our country was uh, very rich. Uh, when started 1918, uh, 1918, 18 November, they got dependence, real, you know, you know, from Germans and whoever were occupied, and we were doing very well. And then, 1940, I was uh, standing on university steps, assigning for next fall in the June, and I see the tanks rolling in front, and they were not our uh, army tanks, so I don't know what's happening. My father never told me anything, even when he was working for government part-time. So when I got to the station, it was all full with Russian tanks and speaking Russian. And I finally got a ticket and uh, I went by train home, you know, from uh, Riga to uh, where I lived. Illegal, huh? And I asked my mom what's happening, and my mom said, we don't have country anymore. Russia invaded. That's, they started. When Russia invaded everything, you didn't have nothing anymore. They took everything away from you. I was not able to work in my father's business anymore. I, they sent me to a different town uh, to work in a bank. And uh, my mama said, no, you are not going to take my baby. It was only a street. It was just born uh, August 10th, uh, in, in, in August 18th. She was just a baby. And um, she said, I will take her during the day, a week, and then the weekends you can come back, you know, and visit her. And so that's how we were doing for about a year. And then when Russians, I don't know, I can't tell, I have to look up in a book, I don't, can't remember the dates, when Germans came in and got Russians out. And when this happened, I was able to return home and uh, we got our business back and everything was doing all right. We didn't belong anymore. We were not owners, Germans owned, but uh, they were very civilized and very good and everything was so good. 
So that wasn't too long when we hear, you know, war bombing and noise of planes flying and Russians came back. So my father called up and he said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, so my, uh, my dad only meanwhile, uh, before that, the first time when the Russians came in, they sent everybody to Siberia, a lot of people. My family were all sent, so mama, grandfather, and my brother was 16 years old. They were sent to Siberia. They didn't send me to Siberia because I lived in other town where they assigned me to work. But, and they didn't take a street along, but uh, they came in in the morning to pick up for shipping in the box cars. They left a street on the floor in the playpen. And in the morning, I, next morning, I get a call to come and pick up my door. And the Russian, uh, whoever he was, was watching me in the bank. He said, no, you are not going to get her. I am going to get her. So if I would go back home, they probably would pick me up and send also to Siberia. So uh, I waited in the evening for a street for him to bring her to me in the apartment. And he came in and he was looking all over and looking in there. And I said, what the he is looking for? Then I realized he was looking for my father because he fled to the forest and was hiding all the time till the Germans came out again. So when uh, Germans came in back uh, and Russians went out, my dad came out and we were doing everything all right. They let us to work in the factory and everything was going all right. And then Russians came back and my father said we have to leave, so Germans gave us a chance, you know, to uh, get to port, to, told uh, they wanted us to leave earlier because we were working for German army, getting uh, uh, barracks built for, uh, I don't know, where, for what they were using. Later they said that they used for the Jews in a concentration camp. But, uh, I don't know if that's true, but that's what they were saying. So, uh, when we know that we cannot stay, my dad said, what are you going to do? So we have to leave. So he, <laughs> yeah, we just left in our books. You can read how we left, you know. It was a journey, but you can never, don't want to remember, and you, you, you cannot forget. Can you imagine 16 years old little baby and four years old and invalid husband? That time uh, he was sick, he was able to walk, and my dad, and then the girl who took care of my uh, baby, uh, she was only 16 months old, um, she said, I won't come along. So finally my dad said, okay, can you imagine all these people, you know, on one little, you know, play, uh, I don't know, carriage, you know, special build around edges so the children can sleep and to get all things that you need for, for clothing and some food. So we just left, I just walked down the steps from the house and looked up and that was it. You, I didn't know where I'm going or what's going to happen. So that was a long, long journey to the, get to the port. There were two ships left who was going to sail from uh, Latvia to Germany. And uh, we were lucky when we got in one ship, was sailing in the evening. The was other ship that was a dock, you know, a little bit away, but got bombed and went down. They said that people, Latvian people, long time walked down the Baltic Sea were 
looking, you know, if they can find some relatives who got killed on that. So we were born, I guess, on the lucky star. We went all the way through on a carriage to the port. The bombings were going over the head, and you saw the carriage is all bombed down, and horses dead, and people crying and screaming. And we just went through down to our destination to the port, get to the port. So we did get to the ship in the evening. We were just like person to person, you know, standing up, you know, uh, kids, you know, children were able to sleep on the side on the ship. There was a little cot made up for babies and children. That was awful. So when we got in Germany, you know, in a, not Germany, Poland, was occupied by Germany, but uh, then was a screening who was, like my dad was right away, did have to leave. Germans took him in, in a, uh, later I find out that when he found me out, he was working as an engineer, which he was, and um, he got education in Estonia. That time from Latvia, he did have to go to get education to Estonia. That's how he ended. And part time he worked on uh, building walls on the sea. So uh, he he was occupied right away. So they took him away. The young girl who was going to t help me with children was taken away by Germans. My husband he was not able to work, so they left him, uh, you know, with a family. So we didn't know. What's going to happen to us? We were refugees. So we were traveling from one place to other place in a train. Then sometimes trains were stopped for a long, long time underground because heavy bombing was going around. And um, only organizations like Salvation Army and Red Cross walked through the platform when the train stopped and gave the children cookies or something, you know, candy or whatever, you know. So we were just going from uh, one, one station, one place, one town to other town to finally we got final destination, what they call Esslingen, and that was a refugee place. No, we, we went, first we were in the Podersam, that was Czechoslovakia. And we did have to leave. <laughs> that was again a nightmare. We have to leave in the night because after war ended, the place where we stayed in Podersam, we thought we'll be free, you know, and uh, we will go back home or whatever. It happened that the Russians took that, that part. They were divided between, you know, uh, Germany and, you know, so uh, our part where we stayed, that uh, Potersam went to the Russians, so we didn't have no choice. Uh, you stay there, you'll be killed, definitely, or, you know, travel again. So we finally, uh, some young man got some old German truck, was left on the roadside and fixed up, you know, so, you know, Right, driving condition, and Russians all got drunk during the night. In the evening, his wife came over and said, if you can get your children quiet and get already one o'clock, uh, we are going to uh, drive, you know, away, uh, try to get in American zone. Uh, and know the town, you know, where it was, so. Well, I was lucky, got my baby buggy out, and got Zyg, was only three months old, my third child, and the uh, second one was, you know, pretty good. My children, for some reason, didn't cry, and Astrid, she was just like a little soldier. She <laughs> took everything, you know, 
just did everything what had to do, and that's it. There was no complaining or crying. So we left at one o'clock, and we, that tra uh, lucky, no Russians were, was in the way. We got on a border where it was American zone, and we stopped uh, there, and soldiers came right away over, wanted to know, you know, from where we are, why did we come? And I was lucky that I did have a language well enough to talk to them. And I explained that uh, while we left, and they said, well, the Russians are just as good people as we are. I thought, oh boy, you don't know <laughs> what you are talking about. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, you did have to be nice and explain what it is. And so they said, okay, we are going to talk to, uh, you know, people who were, you know, tell, you know, what we can do, stay or we have to leave. So finally they, after a while, came back and said, okay, you can stay in this old schoolhouse till they are going to find some other place for you. Can you imagine small children, how you would feed them all the time, how you can dress them or what you do with them? If you ask me today, I don't know how I did. I really don't. But um, we somehow we survived. And then uh, when the commander came back and he said, we are sending you to Esslingen. And that was our refugee camp, what we would say, and, uh, where we started, uh, ended refugee, and we became a, a, a illegal citizen, you know, legal immigrants. And we didn't know what our future will be. So that what we just going from one day to another day. Live till we were able to emigrate. And uh, but we did have to prove, you know, the lot of paperwork, health, everything, you know. Uh, that was not easy, easy to get uh, you know, to any place unless you really prove who you are. We were lucky that my husband's uncle, he sponsored us. But when we came to the United States, that was to us, you know, to um, make over. Government did not pay anything. Till today I'm living here, I have not got one cent from government. Uh, my father, I call, uh, got called uh, my uh, gentleman for who I worked. He uh, paid a thousand dollars security, and I called my father over here, 1951, and I was responsible for everything for him. I never got from government one cent, or I never got one cent when I came over. I didn't have to find work. I, I started uh, doing housework. I cleaned three homes till uh, somebody find out that uh, more about me, what education I have, what I can do. And, and then lucky one, I got hired and uh, was engineering department I worked engineering records for 30 years. But it was up to you to make go of it. Government would not pay anything. Now, I don't understand. Everybody can come in and government pays everything. Children's school, for schools, for everything. I sent my kids to school. I didn't have to pay everything. Books and everything. Uh, I didn't know what it is that government do something for you. So things have changed. Mom, I have a drink. I'll see if there's some questions here. So if you have anything but you want to know more, that's about history of okay. short short history of my life. All right. Do you want to stand up so I can sure. make sure she understands you? Yeah. I was wondering if uh, you learned what became of your mother your yes. I did, uh, that, that's a yeah. experience was, uh, I don't remember the year 1965, I think I came home from work 
and a minister from church came over and uh, handed envelope. And I opened that envelope that was my cousin's from Red Cross, my cousin's letter, where she wrote that my mama is alive, my brother is alive, grandfather passed away, buried in Siberia, and my brother is all right. <laughs> and I just fainted. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was too much, you know, to uh, to find out. And then from there on, I, uh, I got, got the contact right away uh, where my brother was in uh, Siberia, and he was uh, um, uh, what they call forest ranger in the school and that they are doing all right. So from there on, I, I knew what, that I, my family was all right. And the first time I saw in 1971, when my the husband passed away, I, I said, I don't care what happened to me. Uh, Russia was still in Latvia, and everybody said that's scary for me, and I won't come back if I will go. So I said, I don't care what happened to me, I'm leaving. So I went uh, 1971 to Latvia, and uh, you won't believe when my mom left, she was a very attractive lady, and uh, every and, and there I go down, you know, from a, a plane, you know, walk down, you know, and I see that old lady, you know, like me now with a cane you know, standing in a gate. That was a shot, a shock again to me. And I didn't know that was my mother. But that's it was. That's what Siberia did to her. And in America, we didn't wear hats and happened. I went down there, I didn't have a hat. And when I got out, my mom looked at me, he said, oh dear girl, don't you have a hat? She said, she said, my brother, you know, she told my brother, you go and get your sister hat. You know, she can't walk without. And I said, Mama, <laughs> I said, I don't want, we do not wear hats in America. She did not understood because we were pretty well off uh, living in Latvia and uh, uh, clothes and appearance meant a lot. And uh, she was kind of fussy, fussy lady about, you know, having hat and shoes and dress in order. <laughs> and there comes door, you know, without no hat. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Some of them may have oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them Is there an object that you carried with you that is cherished from your life in Europe? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. There is there is something your watch and your your brooch. Yeah. Yeah. You carried it with you. Yeah. Your there, there was a very little when we when we left, you know, my father was would not allow to have jewelry when we got the jewelry that did they have to have a silver or gold or or some sto real stone, he said that, uh, and when we left, when we did have to leave country, he made me to make a little, little uh, bag, you know, what you would call, and on the string, and they put a hang on, the, on your neck. I carried all the time through my jewelry in that. And once, when I was young girl, I bought some, Australia has a brooch. Uh, uh, my mama even took to Siberia. And I came up and he looked at that brooch and he said, well, you just look like gypsy. I did have a little uh, necklace, you know, on that brooch. And he looked at me at supper time. He said, you look just like gypsy. <laughs> because <laughs> Astrida has that pen. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
they, they would like to know, Mom, about your how on earth you when you spoke to the to the American soldiers, how how is it you knew English or what other languages did you know at the time? Well, the languages was my hardest part in, in, in academy. Math and business and that physics and history was what I was interested. Languages was not. I mastered pretty good English, but German was very, I did not want it. I, did, I didn't like the teacher. And my dad got a tutor. I did have to stay after uh, classes. And that old man did his work and I did have to do my, and that German was really, really, really headache. But uh, <laughs> finally I decided, oh no, I can go ice skating while I am sitting here. I better start to get my act together. So I started to study German and got, you know, up to the point, you know. We did have the, when we graduated from academy, we did have the written uh, test and then also, I don't know how you say, the teacher call you in the front and they ask you to tell, you know, this, uh, you know read and then tra tell that in, in English. That's how we graduate. If you do, was not able to do that, you didn't pass. And I was shaking, I would say, <laughs> for quite a few days when exams came, uh, you know, if I will be passing or what's going to happen to me. Uh, but I did all right. Mama, what was it like writing your book? But how, what happened to you after you wrote the book? Remember all about the people that showed up? The people that, that came? After you wrote the book, the book was published? Yeah. What do you mean people? Well, the people that called and came. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Many people who, who didn't even know what I was uh, in, in the country. Uh, you know, we're alive. Yeah, they they start looking up on me, you know, <laughs> finding you know more more about it. They didn't know that I existed. They thought <laughs> I am a lost person. So I have gained lot of lot of people I have found, you know, who I never even remember, you know, many times. What did you expect your life would be when you were 16, when, when you were finishing school? We, did, did you think you were going to go further in college, oh, work yeah. for grandfather? Were you going to get married? Oh, yeah. Stay yeah, home? Was, what were you going to do? Well, I, I know exactly what I did have to do. I did have to work. I worked in my dad's business when I was 10 years old. After school, I did have to go to the office and they, I still have, I don't know what you call these things, you know, we didn't have a, a calculators or anything like that, but we have these things, you know. Abacus. Yeah. yeah the beads. I, I still have at, uh, here in, in America. That, that is one thing what has saved. Uh, my brother, mother saved me. She took Siberia and she brought back and when she died, she made a little bundle and there was a thing in it. And I, I remember that was where I worked in, in office when I was 10, 11, 12. When I was in academy, I did have to work summers. I worked three summers. One first summer I worked about two miles from home in a, in a warehouse in, in a bookkeeping. And I, I rode a bike 12 miles every morning to the work and 12 miles again back in the evening after work. That was first summer. The second summer, they sent me away from home and my mother cried and she just thought the whole world is going to end. They sent me again to some warehouse to work uh, in, in, in office. And then I ended as a cashier and for the whole summer. In the third summer, I was back again, close to the home, again in office. That's how it was. Uh, to get diploma, you did have to do that. We were, when I, when I graduated, I was full-pledged bookkeeper or whatever in business. 
And then I started in, in our country, university is not like here, where you have a housing. There is just a huge big building, and now uh, you go in, your hours when you're a professor, but for what you sign, like I signed business administration, I did, my professor say sign me a certain hour, which days I did have to be there. And that how you, that's how you graduate. And, but I only did have a chance to finish first year. The second, I was, was a first, end of first, in the June, I was going to sign up for a fall, and the Russians came in, and that my ended. But what I was going to do, I definitely was going to uh, run my dad's business. That was my destination. What did you really want to do? What I really wanted to be a pianist. <laughs> <laughs> that was my dream, be a concert pianist. I listened by hours when I went to academy. In the morning I wouldn't take uh, any um, bus, bus or anything like that, streetcar. I walked and then I, when it was consultatory, I stopped in a half hour outside and listened, you know, where they were playing and I thought that was my dream. My brother's dream was to be a sea captain. He never missed one ship when he came in in a, in a port, you know. My mom always brought him in to see. That was his dream. Didn't work out either. But uh, I was definitely, um, oh yes, one last year when I was at Academy, my father bought me a, a piano. On one day I come home, you know. I walk in the rooms, look, you know, there's a beautiful piano. He said, that's, here it is your dream, play all you want after you have done your work. <laughs> Mom, in your book you talked about feelings of how women were different in during the war and after than the men in the families, because you yourself had a difficult time with, with your husband. Well, I think the war destroyed uh, many, many families. Uh, I definitely blame the war because when I married, I married a very young man, uh, very young, very uh, good-looking young man, and he was in the, uh, his father did have a connection with uh, uh, lumber, where my dad bought a lot of lumber uh, for, from uh, them, and that's how I got acquainted with him, you know, he brought the lumber over and so, so on, so on. Uh, they thought, family thought that was a good match. And then he went in business with my dad to help my dad. And we were doing all right. But the war destroyed our marriage. Because uh, men didn't have things to do just to go around and, you know, there was hard time. Something but I do not want to remember. What were the women doing? Well, the women were sitting in the beds and crying, and, and, and they weren't able to understand how I can, uh, you know. I don't know, I just did what I have to do. I, I, my children didn't cry, and I really didn't cry. I took uh, life as it was from one morning to other. When my uh, third daughter was born in Podersau, the town was bombed. Half town was bombed, and I didn't know. Uh, I they even was able to take care of me. They sh uh, sent us all down in the basement, and I didn't know if my family will be when when I get up. You know, the bombing be over or what? The, you know, finally I was lucky. They were all all right. Only Astrida would not go to shelters anymore. You know, at the end, she sat at the bed and she said, Mother, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> so I did have to stay with her. And uh, one night when they were bombing, they 
cut off half, half building and uh, we were sitting on a bed. <laughs> uh, our politics, Mom, Latvia was independent. Um, so you have democracy, you have yes. fascism, you have communism. No. Then you have a good old American democracy again. How, did, how in 98 years do you go around and around? You're a very political woman. I am, <laughs> because my, my dad was involved in politics. And um, first thing when I got married second time, uh, I introduced uh, uh, my my husband to be, and my dad uh, approved everything. But then he said, he looked right at my husband. He said, "Are you Democrat or Republican?" <laughs> 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 and my, I think my, my husband was, you know, he did. <laughs> you know, was kind of, you know, he said, well, he said, I think you can say I'm Republican. <laughs> he said, that's all right then. <laughs> so I wonder what he would do if he would say he's Democrat. What, what do you remember, Mom, maybe being the most difficult decision you had to make during the time of the war and the problems in, in Europe? when we lived in Europe, what do you think was the most difficult decision you had to make? Well, really, what difficult decision was to make how I'm going to support my family. If I stay in Germany, I did. I was able to stay in Germany, but I would have to get a job. I did have to work. And, you know, I, that was really, I was in a time when, when you really didn't know what to make or, or what to think or what's going to be happening tomorrow. A lot of people were uh, thinking about returning back to Latvia. <coughs> Some of them did, you know. I, I think in the times uh, we were just very, very confused. Well, my, my life was so confused because my marriage uh, broke up and I didn't know, uh, you know what, we, in Germany is a law, like if I would, I started divorce in Germany, uh, I did have a, a lucky uh, one relative who was a, a general in uh, uh, Latvia, uh, Latvian army, and he was uh, a, re a relation to my husband, and he came over and he said, I'm, we are going to stand by you and help you uh, to start for a divorce, so which I did. And when, you know, in Germany was a law, if we get a grant divorce, two children would go youngest to me, and two oldest would go to my husband. That's a German law. And I said, oh no, I am not going one child. You know, they are mine and they are stay, will stay mine. So we called divorce off. So what happened when we got together again, when his uncle didn't know that we have a marriage problem, he called us to America. And one of the Quaker church came over and wanted to talk to me about it. And I even didn't know where my husband was, but I pretended, you know, that everything is all right. And I said, well, I will let you know what decision we have. And lucky my father came to visit and I told my dad and he went back home and located my husband and said, well, what are you going to do? Uh, can you get together and get, you know, to America? Because my dad wanted me to go to America. That's what he wanted to, to try to get, you know, to America. And um, so uh, he said, okay, he will go along. But as it, uh, as it was, we got all papers, we got, uh, you know, here. When we got uh, in America, you know, we, our marriage was gone. And I did have a start, you know, on my own, my road, which was not very easy with four little children. <laughs> so Anyone else has a question? Yes. 
What scared you the most on your journey? What scared me most? But what scared me most was, was a bomb, an bombing time. But then again, I think you got so scared that you didn't hear, you know, what happened to you. You know, you just was lucky that you were still alive. With, uh, when you see in the evening, when they start to throw these little candles to uh, give you a signal that there's going to be a bombing, it kind of scared you. You never know, okay, is this going to be your last day or you are going to survive? The, I think the bam bombing time during the war was the most scary time. You, you, when you help, you know, three small children. Yes, sir, back there. There's somebody in the back had a question. Oh, I'm um, when you were in the refugee camp, did you have the world to pick from and you picked the United States? Or were you in an American camp and they sent you to the United no, States? No, how I came in in the United States was that, uh, I don't know. It's a displaced persons camp in Germany. For, in Germany. We, we lived in a Latvian displaced persons camp. There were yeah. three big buildings and we had a school that was Latvian. Yeah. And many of the Latvians had the opportunity to immigrate to Australia, which they did, or Canada, or the United States. But because of my father's uncle working for Ford Motor Company and, the, and connections to the Quaker Church, they sponsored us. You had to have a sponsor. You had yeah. to pay for each adult and each child, which my uncle did. And then you had to have a job at that place for three months before you could go out into the community and start working towards your green card. Yeah. You had your naturalization papers much, much later. I got mine when I turned 18. Uh, I couldn't get them before that. My yeah. mother every year filled out the green Since card the, at the post office for all of us. In, in so. evening, you know, the end of the year, you, know, you they better than you or they uh, send you, you know, you have to leave a country. And the same thing that scare you if you do something but you don't uh, uh, do right, you know, they are going to deport you. They, they I don't know, was a lot different in 1949, 50, 60 as it is now. I remember one time I, I did have to run just before midnight and I knew year, end of the last day, so renew my cards. So they don't report me. <laughs> yes. Do you remember like how it was for you when you became a citizen? Like how did you feel about that? How was it? Yeah. <laughs> Scary. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was just shaking. Uh, I did have a sponsor who came with me. It was my uh, uh, factory who owned for whom I worked. Uh, his wife came uh, with us. And I remember she was holding my hand and she said, don't worry, don't worry, everything is going to be all right. We did have to remember, we, they gave a little booklet, you know, and they ask you a question and then you did have to say the, you know, everything what they ask you in that book, you know, answer, you know, so you know very much history, you know, about uh, America. That was scary. When I got that flag, <laughs> and when I got finally, oh, I thought the whole world opened. <laughs> Any more? Yes. The, when you were in um, the apartment in that town and the Russian soldier said he would go and get Estrita rather than you going back? Yeah. Do you think he was trying to save you or look for your father? He was, I think, doing both. He was very nice to me. Uh, that is very strange. I, I think I'm the only one citizen who never have anything bad to say about the German or Russian. They, they, the, the bank where I worked, he was so good. Well, he was assigned to watch me during the working hours too, you know. He watched everything. One time he came over and he said, and he said, do you know, I have a wife and a four years old little girl back in Russia. I haven't seen, seen them for a couple of years. 
he was uh, kind of, he was very nice to me. But you are right, when he came, uh, when he brought us Strida, he, I think he probably was scared that if I go, you know, I will never come back. He knew that for a fact. That's why he kept me and he went to get the street. But in apartment, he did look around. He was looking to get some sign for my dad. They, they, they have a money, uh, I don't know how, I don't remember how much it was, 25 lots or something like that for if they find my dad. They have posters. Posters, you know, all over. Yeah. But they never did. He was in a forest. When, when Germans came in and the Russians went out in the evening, you know, one evening I got my kids all cleaned up and put them to bed and somebody knocked at the door about seven o'clock in the evening. Or, and I said, well, who would that be? You know, that was not, you know, kind of scary. So I went to the door and there was a, standing a man with beard, you know, all grown up. My dad came out from a forest. He was hiding from one farm to other. He knew very much farmers around there. He bought a lot of lumber. So he knew who is a communist and who isn't communist. And that's how he was able to escape the first night when my mama was sent to Siberia. And brother, when he escaped was the workman. He did have seven children. And my dad to, to uh, care of these kids at Christmas time. He bought them shoes and clothes, and, and he was the one who knocked at the window and told my dad to get out right away from, from a house. So he, my dad got right away to the foreman's place, got motorcycle, and pushed out on the main highway, and. Uh, he, uh, the foreman took my dad to my aunt's place between our town and Riga and uh, left at my aunt's house. And then from aunt's house, my dad was going from one farm to other farm, just coming back, you know, to um, where our homestead was. Tell him about your motorcycle experience. Oh, that was... That was tell, a, tell them what you rode. Uh, BMW, <laughs> small small size, real made thing. <laughs> well, it was fun. <laughs> Till my father got me and brought me home, and that was the last time when I saw my motorcycle. But you raced one day with your cousin's help. Yeah, that's what I did. My cousins know they. So they helped you fix it. Yeah, they 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 fixed all up. The, when the workmen too, they both said you can do it, you can do it, you know. They and I thought, okay, guys, if you say I can do it, I can do it. And I thought my dad was out of town. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. At the end, you know, when it was. He was right there. He was very nice. He said, we are going home. <laughs> Which we did. Yeah, but you won second prize. Oh, yeah. yeah. I did, and I left a prize I carried to the Podersan. We did have a big box, you know, where we got all together. I held that, you know. That was a, a real amber uh, crystal uh, ashtray. <laughs> I can still see today. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, Maz. Um, tell a story about the um, pits along the apartments. The what? Like the pits where the people would stand there, and you'd have to like. Not You're talking about the bomb shelter? No. It's the apartments? No. Where? I don't want to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> But like where you would stand there and you'd have to like turn around. Come tell me. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what, what do you mean? Honey? Where was this? Like where they would dig those big pits. Oh, what, what you saw when you were walking, Mother, 
when the, the trench they were digging one day? Oh, yes, to work uh, the big Latvia. Um, that was uh, the time uh, when Jews were picked all up. And that was, that was very strange. I, I did have to go uh, to the work and I walked down and I go by the police station and there was a real pretty uh, edge, you know, like a trees and, and everything, you know, you walk down. And I look up and I see all these big trenches and I, I, I don't know what, what, for what they would be digged up. So uh, my uh, husband did have a cousin who was uh, working in the police department and I did have to go by and I uh, stopped him and, and I said, uh, uh, listen, he said, I said, tell me, I said, why are you digging up here these big trenches down here? And he said, you don't want it to know. She said, just go to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I just walked, when I came back, all covered and nothing left, you know, all flat. And I said, oh, well, that's strange. So in an evening, Arthur came over and he told me he, what it was. And he said, I better tell you because you will never uh, be quiet or never, you know, live till you know, you know what it was. And that was a saddest day in my life. That was one saddest day. The second was when I was coming home. From well, you gotta explain what, I assume you understand what happened. They lined him up, shot him. They dropped him in the trench, trench, covered him up. And they said the they Jewish shot him for Napoleon, and then they covered him. We're, our family has been Lutheran forever, so we were not touched by the, by the Jewish um, problem that was occurring in the country. We did have a few Jews, like we have a, a, a electric station belonged uh, in, in Riga, not in Riga, in Ligatne, the factory was. Was a, he, he was a Jewish, and he asked my dad long time before to leave for Germany. He left, so I never know what Engelhardt was his name. I never know what happened to him. But uh, they cleaned up all Jews in the town. There wasn't anybody left. It was a small, small town. There was all, all, everybody, everything was gone. That's how they did. But then again, Russians, okay, the same um, young man, I think he was about 14, 15, 16, walking in front of me. I was behind him, and there comes a Russian soldier right beside me, bang, bang, and a young man fall on the face down on the sidewalk. And I did have to walk by, you know, to get the apartment. It's a nightmare, but you can never forget, you know, you all, that, that is still, I can still see it. Now, I try for many years to forget everything, you know, just go, like my mama when I was, uh, when I found her first meeting, he said, dear door, don't think about past, just think ahead, you know. And I try to forget, you know, so so hard. But you just there is a things in the life, but you can just not forget. But we encouraged her to do this, and it was agony. <laughs> it was. I woke up in the it night. It was agony. Mm -hmm. but, um, Mom got through it. She got through it. So we had a nice, nice story at the end of it. I got up in the middle of the night thinking, you know, and then I got up. <laughs> that, then I was still able to write. My hand was still working. Right now I can't write anymore because I did have a surgery and I don't know what happened. I just cannot write anymore. So that's why I did have to make a tapes and somebody else did have to write for me. But I try to remember. Every, in the book, everything what is in there is, is really what happened. There is nothing make up story to sell a book. <laughs> There's 
every word but this in there is a <coughs> true thing. And some things I probably, couple things I left out because I, that time when I did that, I just thought that will be for a street and for my other doors. I didn't think that it's going to be <laughs> sold, you know, in the market. <laughs> and uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I left few things out, you know. But it's been a wonderful time. So many people have discovered that she is alive because she has spent probably the last 20 years. Yeah. She has come here in the summertime and lot, and in winter in Michigan, she doesn't go out very much. Yeah. And her church closed down, so she doesn't have that resource anymore. So she pretty much lives by herself all winter long and has few friends. And these people all discovered that she was still living. Yeah. So, you know, they were coming over and calling and, and sending flowers and visiting and all kinds <laughs> of stuff. So it was, it was a very strange yeah. fall. Uh, Mrs. Whelan was so into this book that um, she just couldn't let it go. She said, we're going to Amazon with it, and which is what she did. And in that process, the professor at U of M in history is Latvian, and he's three years younger than I am, and his father sent him out of the country before the end came. He and his mother left, and then the father eventually got out. So he was curious as to meet my mother and talk to us about, about our experience compared to what their family went through. Um, it, it was just interesting, and U of M did an article on Mother and Mrs. Whelan, who was a U of M grad, and the history professor, and there's an architect who just finished a beautiful building in Riga, who's Latvian. So there are a lot of Latvians around in the United States when they come out of hiding, <laughs> once, you, once you find out who they really are. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. no, they, they thought I'm gone dead. <laughs> Very. And, and a lot of people, we grew up in a small town the size of Haldisburg. A lot of people did not know much about us. They didn't really, they I didn't never, know any of this. I never talked about We didn't you, talk about it. The strangest thing is, when I worked for Kamsi Products Engineering, uh, we have a lot of customers like General Electric and Emerson, you know, representatives to come in. And one got a newspaper in Chicago or somewhere where an article written about my father. At the end of the book, as you know, that Latvian millionaire dies, you know, in, in America, or you know, big write up, you know. And that um, Emerson uh, salesman come in and bring that and put on Mr. Herrick's desk. He said, I think that girl works for you. <laughs> and he read that paper, you know. And there was not too long, you know, when they, we got called. Would you come in Herrick's office? And so did my husband. He was engineer there. So got him, you know. And I thought, oh my God, who is going fired? <laughs> you know, we get down in, down to his office, you know. And he shows in front of me that paper. He said, why do you never said anything about yourself, you know? About it? I said, what do they have to tell you? He, uh, it happened that our house was right across, you know, his big mansion, and my dad always went for a walks, you know. And uh, he he was so upset that I didn't tell, you know, what the, who I, I said. I didn't felt that I have to advertise myself. Yeah, we were the only foreign family in the community. They had this is before Never. Vietnam and all the rest. We were the only ones that ever had. And when, I, when we came to this country, I was already in fourth grade. <laughs> and they didn't know what to, mother had no papers, didn't know what to do with me. I spoke three languages. I was nine, going on 10. They didn't know what to do. So it started me in kindergarten. I went through <laughs> kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. <laughs> By spring, after the three months or so, I was finally in fourth grade, which was close enough. And when we moved into the next town, which is the size of Haldis, because that's a little small farm town. We'd like going to school in, I don't know, not quite Nuri, but you know, something small. And I said, that's it, I've had enough. We're not, we're, we're not going out another grade. We're just, in spring, <laughs> we're finished. Yeah. I said, we're staying in fourth grade. So I graduated when I was 19, because yeah, I didn't do that away. other 
that other fifth grade. Um, but they didn't know what to do with me. I, the one vivid thing I remember was my math was taught in a different manner. Long I did not do I did not do long division. I had never heard of it. There's a short way to do division. It's not the long tables. She's and they didn't want me in the class with the students. So they put me out in the hall, gave me butcher block paper and paints and everything else, and they made murals for them because they didn't want me in class while they were doing long division. And then I remember I had some episodes in, in high school where we studied World War II, and I couldn't handle it. Right? I walked, walked yeah. out of the room. Because kids giggled and laughed and thought it was funny, some of it, you know, you know ha ha, poor people. Um, I couldn't take it. There was a time, one time, we were trapped in a bomb shelter for a very long time. The doors got bombed over and until we were rescued and dug out, people died, people got scared, there wasn't enough air to Children breathe for dying. some. Didn't so, have milk for babies. You know, it just wasn't funny <laughs> to the point where, I guess it wasn't funny, they just didn't take it seriously. Now since, since the 50s, we've had a lot more wars. And kids have been exposed to a lot more stuff. But in the 50s, you know, there wasn't that much going on. This it was before all that started happening. So to be a foreigner, it was, it was kind of different. Yeah, that was, was different. And, and I had, I, I just had an, ex and it just stays with you, what, what you go through like that, because I was in uh, Ireland, no, in Scotland, I was in Scotland, and I went to see a program called um, Totu, Totu, whatever it is, it's a, it's a band thing, big spectacle they do all over Europe, they have all these military bands, and they have a program. Well, that night when we were there, tat Tattoo, it's called, yeah. They have a big castle kind of building at the end of the football, football rugby field. And they, they put up shows like, you know, graphic things on there with the lights and all that. Most of that stuff's beautiful, depending like the Chinese were running around with their um, animal things and fans and everything. They had Chinese stuff on the wall. All at once comes this band, this, this band down the, down the you know, walkway or the big field and the sirens start and the bombing runs start on the wall. You see the planes coming in through the, the big bombers and the sound effects. I went into shakes. I just couldn't, just, if I had known they were going to do that, I would have been all right. But to visually all at once hear it and see it, I couldn't take it. I mean, I had a rough night that night. The only other time that ever happened, I don't watch war movies, but the other only time that happened was when my, when my children were young, we were camping up in Massachusetts or Maine or somewhere. We were a campsite, and all at once in the middle of the night, you hear the bombers. There's a special sound to bombers. If you've yeah. watched World War II movies, you hear that bombing run. You hear that sound of those propellers and those bombers. And all at once, you could, we could hear it. It was coming up and going down, coming up. It, they were practicing on old planes in the middle of the night well, in this airport. That that's was, all it was, but it, it did me in that night. Uh, so when those kinds of things happen to you, even when you're young, you can forget. They stay with you, even when you're well, old. Astrid they was ten months. Uh, so, you know. uh, how old we was when we came to this country first Almost year? Ten, nine, if the planes were going over. She ran right <laughs> under the bed. Planes. <laughs> I fly now. <laughs> she was right under the bed. But it, it, I think all these people who go through this kind of trauma, like Mother said, the thing that upset her so often was the bombing. Because when the bombing started, you didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. You didn't know who was going to live or die. And like the one building, when I finally refused to go down underground anymore, we stayed huddled in this part of one end of the building that day, yeah, and the other yeah. end got bombed. Yeah. The part we were sitting in was fine. Yep. You know, we didn't go to the shelter. <laughs> Astrid so, said, Mom, I am not going anymore. That <laughs> was... So it, it, all these people that are going through things like that... That was happened you know. after the big... Uh, when we got digged into and we didn't got uh, out by the noon. Yeah. Little babies crying, no milk, nothing, you know, no bathroom. Oh, gee. I don't know how we survived. Anyway, any more? I think we've kept you probably way past your hour of class. 
I can I can think we can all agree that this was a great opportunity to, to listen to your experiences and what better way to celebrate Mercy Week than hearing from two strong female voices. So thank you, Mrs. McClanahan, and thank you, Erna, for sharing your, your experiences with us. There, there, are, there are two copies of this book in the library. I just gave them one the other night when I came up here for the soccer game. So they have two of these in the library. And they're on Amazon, and they're on Kindle. So. Thank you. To remember, I try so hard to forget it. <laughs> but since it's coming back, I just told my friend that at Venezuela that I'm coming home. He said, she said, good, you have to talk to the uh, Rotary Club in November. <laughs> I said, I'm not coming home. <laughs>